Study of Language George Yule Language and the Brain Complete Chapter 12 Our ability to use language is located in our brain. As Dr. Alice Flaherty in 2004 reported, whose woman patient who was unable to feel her own leg due to a stroke on her left hemisphere, but she could still talk about it, the ability to talk was unaffected, and hence clearly located, somewhere else in her brain. Neurolinguistics. The study of the relationship between language and the brain is called neurolinguistics. It has a long history dating back to the 19th century. A significant discovery was made in 1848 when Phineas Gage, a construction foreman, survived a severe brain injury after an iron rod pierced his skull. Yet, he luckily survived. This incident suggested that Language is not located in the frontal lobe of the brain as was previously thought. Gage's remarkable recovery made him a medical phenomenon, contributing significantly to the understanding of language and brain function. Language areas in the brain. Brain areas related to language functions are primarily located around the left ear. Focusing on the left hemisphere, the shaded areas in figure indicate the locations of language functions involved in speaking and listening. These areas were identified through autopsies of individuals with specific language disabilities, allowing researchers to determine the areas responsible for language abilities in normal users by finding damaged areas in individuals with language impairments. This knowledge has been crucial in understanding the neural basis of language. There are four parts in our brain which control our speaking and listening abilities. Number one, Broca's area. Number two, Wernick's area. Number three, the motor cortex. And number four, the arcuate fasciculus. Broca's area is a part of the brain in the left hemisphere that involves in speech production. Paul Broca, a French surgeon, discovered in the 1860s that damage to a specific area in the left hemisphere of the brain led to severe difficulties in speaking, while damage to the same area in the right hemisphere had no such effect. This finding led to the conclusion that language ability is primarily located in the left hemisphere and that Broca's area is crucial for generating spoken language. Wernick's area is the part of the brain in the left hemisphere, which involves in language comprehension. Karl Wernick was a German doctor who, in the 1870 seconds, reported that damage to this part of the brain was found among patients who had speech comprehension difficulties. This finding confirmed the left hemisphere location of language ability and led to the view that Wernick's area is part of the brain crucially involved in the understanding of spoke language. Motor cortex controls the articulatory muscles of the face, jaw, tongue, and larynx, and hence the physical articulation of speech. In the 1950s, two neurosurgeons, Penfield and Roberts 1959, found that by applying small amounts of electrical current to specific parts of the brain, they could identify areas where the electrical stimulation would interfere with speech production. Arcuate fasciculus are bundle of nerve fibers connecting Broca's area and Wernick's area in the left hemisphere of the brain. This was also one of Wernick's discoveries. The localization view. Specific aspects of language ability can be mapped to specific brain regions. According to this view, the word is heard and comprehended via Wernick's area. This signal is then transferred via the arcuate fasciculus to Broca's area where preparations are made to generate a spoken version of the word. A signal is then sent to part of the motor cortex to physically articulate the word. However, this is an oversimplified model and the brain's language processing pathways are likely more complex 
the author notes that our understanding of brain function is limited by our reliance on indirect methods and metaphors, such as comparing brain function to electrical circuits or steam engines. Due to the lack of direct physical evidence, these metaphors can be helpful, but may ultimately prove inadequate as our understanding of the brain evolves. We've all had moments where our brain and speech production don't quite sync up, resulting in minor difficulties like stumbling over words or struggling to express ourselves. These everyday experiences can actually provide valuable insights into how our linguistic knowledge is organized and processed in the brain. By examining these minor production difficulties, we may gain a better understanding of how our brain retrieves and uses language. 1. The tip of the tongue phenomenon. The tip of the tongue phenomenon occurs when we struggle to recall a word, despite knowing it. We often correctly recall the initial, sound and number of syllables, but can't quite retrieve the word. When we make mistakes, the incorrect word often sounds similar to the intended word, for example, secant, instead of sextant. Other examples are fire distinguisher for extinguisher and transcendental medication instead of meditation. This suggests that our brain stores words based on phonological information and some words are harder to access than others. These errors are also called malapropisms, named after a comedic character in one of the plays by Sheridan, Mrs. Malaprop, who frequently made similar mistakes. 2. Slips of the tongue. Slip of the tongue is another speech error in which a sound or word is produced in the wrong place, as in black blocks instead of black boxes. Also known as Spoonerism, named after William Spooner, clergyman who frequently made such mistakes. Examples of Spoonerisms include saying a long showy stort instead of make a long story short, use the door to open the key instead of use the key to open the door, and a 50 pound dog of bag food instead of a 50 pound bag of dog food. Spoonerisms often involve swapping the initial sounds of two words, as in Spooner's own examples, noble tons of soil, instead of noble sons of toil. 3. Slips of the brain. Slips of the brain include word substitutions as a similar, but an inappropriate, word isist instead of the target and sound swaps. In talking about his relationship with the former president, one U.S. president had to quickly correct himself when he said, We've had some triumphs, made. Some mistakes. We've had some sex, eh, setbacks. These slips are categorized into three types. Number one, perseveration, is a type of slip of the tongue in which a sound carries over from one word to the following word s, as in black boxes instead of black boxes, and my favorite fong instead of song. Number 2. Anticipatious. Anticipation is another type of slip of the brain in which a sound is used before its occurrence in the next word, so that Roman numeral comes out as nomen numeral. Number 3. Exchange. In exchange, sounds change places, as in you'll soon be better instead of feel better. Number 4. Slips of the ear. In slips of the ear, the brain misinterprets auditory signals leading to mishearings. For example, in our hearing great ape and wondering why someone should be looking for one dot in his office, the speaker actually said, great ape. During a conversation about dogs, one five-year-old announced my uncle has a pimple, which turned out to be her misheard version of a pit bull. A similar type of misunderstanding seems to be behind a child's, Report that in Sunday school, everyone was singing about a bear called, gladly, who was, cross-eyed. The source of this slip turned out to be a line from a religious song that went, gladly the cross-eyed bear. It may also be the case that some malapropisms, for example transcendental, uncation originate as slips of the ear. These humorous examples offer insights into, how the brain processes language, but some, Language difficulties are due to serious brain function disorders. Aphasia. 
Aphasia is defined as an impairment of language function due to localized brain damage that leads to difficulty in understanding and or producing linguistic forms. The most common cause of aphasia is traumatic head injuries from violence or an accident when a blood vessel in the brain is blocked or bursts. There are three types of aphasia based on the primary symptoms of someone having difficulties with language. Broca's aphasia, Wernick's aphasia, and conduction aphasia. Types of aphasia Number 1. Broca's aphasia Broca's aphasia is a language disorder characterized by reduced speech, distorted articulation, slow, effortful speech, omission of grammatical markers for example articles, prepositions, plural or past tense markers, speech consists mainly of nouns, verbs, and adjectives, agrammatic speech lacking grammatical forms, hesitations and long pauses, difficulty articulating single words, comprehension is typically better than production. I eggs and eat and drink coffee breakfast, my cheek, very annoyance, Main is my shoulder, akin all round here stale, you know what I mean, tall, stale, tempting to say, steamship. 2. Wernick's aphasia, also called sensory aphasia. Wernick's aphasia is a language disorder characterized by difficulty in auditory comprehension, fluent but unclear speech, use of general terms instead of specific ones, difficulty finding the correct words anomia, use of strategies like description or purpose to overcome, word finding difficulties. Examples of speech with Wernick's aphasia include, I can't talk all of the things I do, vague response, the thing to put cigarettes in, describing an ashtray, a long, struggling attempt to describe a kite, including describing its actions and trying to recall the spelling of the word. Number 3. Conduction aphasia. Conduction aphasia is a rare language disorder caused by damage to the arcuate fasciculus, characterized by fluent speech with occasional mispronunciations, disrupted rhythm due to pauses and hesitations, good comprehension of spoken words, difficulty repeating words or phrases for example, vase for base, fosh for wash, Difficulty transferring understood language to speech production. Symptoms can also occur in other aphasia types, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease, often accompanied by writing and reading difficulties, typically results from left hemisphere injury, demonstrating left hemisphere, dominance for language. Dichotic aphasia the dichotic listening test is an experimental technique that demonstrates the left hemisphere dominance for syllable and word processing. The test explains the fact that the left hemisphere processes information from the right side of the body and vice versa. A subject wears earphones and receives different sounds in each ear simultaneously for example, ga in one ear and da in the other. The subject is more likely to correctly identify the sound that came through the right ear, indicating that the left hemisphere is processing the language signal. Left brain, right brain. Language signals received through the left ear are processed in the right hemisphere before being sent to the left hemisphere, causing a delay. Signals received through the right ear go directly to the left hemisphere resulting in faster processing and a right ear advantage for speech sounds. The right hemisphere processes non-linguistic sounds for example music, noises faster and more efficiently, showing a left ear advantage for non-verbal sounds. The left hemisphere specializes in analytic processing details, sequences, language structures, while the right hemisphere specializes in holistic processing general structures, patterns, overall meaning. This suggests that the brain's hemispheres are specialized for different types of processing, rather than specific types of material. The critical period. Critical parietis, the time from birth to puberty during which normal first language acquisition can take place. The left hemisphere specialization. For language, 
known as lateral dominance or lateralization, develops in early childhood, coinciding with language acquisition. Critical period is a window of optimal brain readiness to receive linguistic input. If a child doesn't acquire language during this period, it becomes increasingly difficult to learn language later in life. Research suggests that the critical period may even start in the womb, and a well-documented case study illustrates the consequences of missing this window of language acquisition. Genie Genie, a 13-year-old girl, was discovered in 1970 after being isolated and deprived of human interaction and language her whole life. Despite her late start, she began to learn language, understanding many words and developing simple syntax. However, her language abilities remain limited, suggesting that the critical period for language acquisition may have passed. Interestingly, tests showed that Jeannie was using her right hemisphere for language functions, rather than the typical left hemisphere, and she exhibited a strong left ear advantage in dichotic listening tests. This raises the possibility that language capacity is more distributed throughout the brain than previously thought. Genie's language development also followed similar stages to those seen in normal child language acquisition.